Okay, now that I've got a, a VNA, I've always wanted a VNA. Uh, back in the day, I had access to a very, very expensive one, and once in a while, I'd sneak in after hours and use it for ham radio use. You know, it was, uh, this was back in the early 1980s, and I think the network analyzer cost us, cost us back then something like $100,000, which was a ton of money back then. I'm not sure how much a good ones cost. That one went to 40 gigahertz. It was a Wilt Wiltron or Anritsu. I, I don't remember now, but a really, 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 really nice one. <laughs> and it was like the gold standard that we calibrated everything to NIST to. But anyway, so last time we were looking at uh, DIY antennas. And that's, I mean, I think that's why everybody wants their nano VNA. I doubt that anybody's really doing RF design at home, but a, a lot of people are doing antennas and radios and they want to measure things. And um, But you can actually design antennas now. Um, it, it is really, really great. So last time we looked at a dipole and uh, uh, we have a, a dipole now. Some people say you need a balanced line to feed a dipole. Well, um, that's somewhat true and somewhat not true. Um, that's the way you could do it, perfectly fine, if you could somehow uh, transmit onto a, uh, a balanced feed line. Now, uh, this used to be really popular like back before World War II. Um, there was no coax uh, before World War II. Coax was something that was invented in World War II. Um, and so transmission lines were all of these parallel ones, these twin feed ones, whether they were 300 ohms or 600 ohms and stuff like that. But uh, then uh, suddenly, suddenly people started going with coax, right? So they had a they had a a, a, a piece of coax with a with, with a center conductor. Now, so how does a piece of coax work? It's a lot like the uh, parallel trans transmission lines. If you have two wires. Um, the RF signal does not travel in the wires. It travels between the wires, okay? There is a uh, electromagnetic magnetic wave that, that gets set up between these two wires. This is a transmission line. And it's much like microwave transmission lines. If you take a look at high frequency stuff, they're actually, uh, they're actually three dimensional boxes um, where the uh, width of the box is set up so that the uh, the wavelength can can sit inside there, and you um, adhere to certain boundary conditions. Certainly, boundary conditions you need to have uh, zero volts, and certain boundary conditions you need to have uh, the magnetic field uh, go to zero. And so, the shape and size of these uh, waveguide uh, structures is governed by Maxwell's equations. I remember taking E and M. You know, back when did I when did I take E and M? Anyway, 40 years ago, um, we actually used to have to solve uh, the Maxwell's equations and determine things. I remember. I remember the final. I remember it was really really difficult. They had us. Uh, they actually had us uh, uh, calculate. Uh, the size of a triangular waveguide. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you go try to do that. <laughs> uh, but you see uh, square waveguides, you see rectangular waveguides, you see round waveguides, and you see round waveguides with center conductors. Well, that is a coax, okay? It can have air inside, it can have dielectric inside uh, for various reasons. Um, and so when the electromagnetism is going through this thing, it's not going through the wires. It's going through, it's going through in, in, in between. Okay, and uh, it's like it's like a, a pipe. You might as well think of it as a pipe. The, the electromagnetic waves are going through that pipe, and uh, when they when they come out the top. Okay, let's say that you have a coax, and it's. Uh, Remember when we calibrate the nano VNA, uh, first of all, we calibrate with an open. So the electromagnetic waves are traveling inside the dielectric, duh, 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 and they get here to the outside world, and they look at the outside world and they go, I don't think I really like it out there. It doesn't look like there's any place for me to go. Um, you know, it, it, doesn't, it, it doesn't magically spill out. No, it, 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 it doesn't see anywhere to go, so it goes back. It reflects back. And if you short it out, uh, you would think, oh, well, you just killed it. You've shorted these terminals together. Well, you've just killed everything. You've shorted out your d device. The, the nano VNA should blow up, right? Well, no, 
uh, the, 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 it's like having a dead end canyon. It's like having an echo in a canyon. The electromagnetic wave travels in and it goes, whoa, I see a mirror. So instead of this time seeing it open, it sees a mirror and it reflects back at opposite phase. It actually inverts phase because it needs to, uh, it needs to be true to those boundary conditions of zero voltage, zero E and M, depending on, depending on, uh, which part of the phase you're looking at. So, um, yeah, it's, it's really, really cool. So how do antennas work? Um, antennas are really, really magical. If you ever try to look at the mathematics of antennas, it's a really poorly understood science. Um, you can do e &M calculations in three dimensions with certain calculators and stuff, but even those people get it wrong. They set up the boundary conditions wrong, and I've seen really, really bad uh, CAD models of antennas and stuff that are just completely wrong. Anyway, um, so, when the E and M wave is, is 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 traveling along and it hits this open spot, it's looking for somewhere to go. It wants to go somewhere. So you provide it with an antenna, okay? So what is an antenna? It's two quarter wave stubs, okay? And those two quarter wave stubs are just the right size for that E and M wave to look and say, oh, wait a minute. Um, I could either go back, which is a certain resistance value, or I can go forward, which is a certain resistance value. And it's always going to take the path of least resistance. And it's going to see these two things as a perfect place to sit. Okay. So you get this nice, you get this nice, uh, uh, actually it's like, this is half wave, right? It's, it's, it's a half wave. Anyway, um, it finds this place to sit. Right, and so that's why you that's why you clip it off to to certain uh, sizes so that the E and M wave will fit there. Um, so um, you can then go the next step. Well, if it likes to fit there, maybe we could give it more places to fit. Right. So one of my favorite antennas is the discone antenna. Okay, the discone antenna is if you have a transmission line. Um, then you 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 the center conductor comes out, but you put a cone, okay? You put a metal, you put a metal cone uh, around around this thing, and so there's this big metal skirt. It's like a funnel, big metal funnel. I'm, I'm going to build one of these later uh, in a different video, and then you take this top and you put a pie plate on top of it, okay? And you put this round, you put this round pie plate on top, and this discone antenna. These are super super cool. Sometimes you'll see them with a bottom section too. So there'd be a top section and a bottom section. If you ever go aboard a Navy ship, look for these things. You'll see them. <laughs> um, they use the ship as one uh, reflector, and then they use the, the top as a different reflector. Sometimes these are, these are just wires sticking out like this. Um, sometimes you'll see them horizontal. Sometimes you'll see them vertical. But, okay, so why am I mentioning these? That's because of this place for the e &M wave to go. When the e &M wave comes out, it, it wants to go out and it sees this wonderful area here. And um, it says, oh, you know, I am this big, okay? I'm this big. And so I find my own little spot so I can resonate right here. If I was longer, I might go, I might go here and I might be happy here. So discount antennas work at a huge wavelength range. Huge, they're, they're the widest band antenna I think around. And so real short wavelengths fit there, real long wavelengths fit there. I always wanted to build a big one of these for 20 meters, um, fill up your backyard. But um, yeah, these are, these, are, these are super, super cool. The other thing you can do is if you have a dipole, you can add a reflector behind it. And what that reflector does is as, as the e &M wave starts to populate this dipole, it feels the effect of this piece over, over here. And it, it, it's like optics. It, it, there's a, a constructive interference and destructive interference as, as these two things interact with one another. And instead of creating, instead of this thing radiating a nice uh, dipole donut, um, it starts interacting with this other element and you get reflections and you get interference and stuff and you might get, you might get lobes. Okay. You get these funny lobes and depending on the spacing of your reflector to your, uh, your dipole, you can get the E and M wave to change different shapes. And believe it or not, we used to do that in LEDs, really, 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 really tiny. 
the, the, the dipoles are where the electrons get changed into photons, and there's a mirror and that cavity. We used to have to solve Maxwell's equations in three dimensions and solve these radiation patterns. It's the exact same equations as you use with antennas. It's really, really, really fun. And so um, the next thing you can do is uh, you can start adding, so this is a reflector, it's usually a little bit longer, you can start adding directors. And what those do is as the NM wave starts to form, it reflects off of this one, but then it sees these guys which are shorter and it says, oh, I think I can fit over there even better. And it says, oh, I want to go this way. And so um, instead of you getting these big broad things from the um, uh, dipole, it starts making a very narrow pole with a bunch of little, t little tiny side blows. So make, it, it wants to go that way because you're telling it, look, I'm going to give you a path. This is the, this is the yellow brick road. Go this way, go this way. So uh, that's a, a Yagi antenna, right? And you can have a, you know, a three element Yagi or a 13 element Yagi. Um, then you can do the next trick. Remember, um, remember the discount antenna. Uh, I should write that down so you can not talk about it. This cone. So look up this cone. Those are really cool. You can buy these too, but um, let's see. Uh, and the next thing you can do is you can say, okay, I'm going to have my uh, dipole and my reflector, and then I'm going to have a whole bunch of different size reflectors. And remember how that uh, disc cone antenna worked? The E and M way finds one that it's happy with. Well, it'll find one of these that it's happy with. And so these are called log periodic. Um, and the log periodic antennas are very, very broadband too, because there is some place for that ENM wave to be happy. It'll find its, its spot with, with, with its wavelength. It finds its spot and it says, oh, I'm really, really happy. And so I'm going to work at that and I'm going to go that direction. And so, yeah, log periodic antennas. Um, and then you can see wild uh, spiral log periodics that NASA uses and uh, yeah, lots of, lots of, lots of, lots of cool stuff. Um, there is some, uh, I don't want to talk about that in this video. Anyway, so let's talk about a really, really, really simple antenna. We talked about dipoles, so let's go to the very, very next one that I think would be interesting, which is a vertical antenna. Okay, so uh, if you have a, a, a dipole antenna, ho a vertical, okay, you could feed this with a uh, you could feed this with a coax over here, and, and the, then you get uh, this vertical thing. Um, but what they do is, instead of making the other side of the um, antenna, they put in a reflector. And they say, okay, we're going to ignore this. We're only going to put this part in. And the, when the e and M wave, so, so now we can just use this as our, as our coax. Okay, so our coax comes in here, and we're going to connect the coax to this thing, and then the center we're going to connect to that thing. Okay, so the ENM wave starts to come out. Remember, the ENM wave is traveling inside here. It's not inside the wires, it's inside here. And it, it comes to the outside world and it goes, ooh, and then it starts it starts seeing these paths that it can take between these two things. And it's a donut too, right? And it goes, ooh, I can do that. And um, because this is uh, at one potential, and this is at a different potential, it um, says, oh, I kind of understand this. It's a lot like when I was a dipole, except there's a mirror here. So anytime I want to go that direction, I can't. So I'm going to reflect myself. Remember the short in the VNA uh, um, uh, calibration? It says, woo, I'm going to go the other way and I'm going to change phase. And so you get like a, you get twice as much stuff going in the up direction. All right, um, and the interesting thing about this configuration also is that if you do the mathematics of a dipole, you find that the uh, impedance of a dipole in free space is 37 ohms, uh, 73 ohms, 73 ohms. You can do that actual calculation. Um, free, free space itself is 377 ohms, okay, um, with nothing, right? That's just when radio waves go through the atmosphere, they're 377 ohms. So this is 373 ohms. But over here, because we're doubling up and everything is on top of one another, the characteristic impedance of a uh, quarter wave vertical is 36 ohms. It's half. 36 ohms. Okay? So, 
Um, what I want to do today is build one of these and see if we measure 36 ohms. And then there's a trick. So we'll save that to the end. There's a trick. Um, and so we can build a really, really simple vertical antenna. And I did. So let's see here. Uh, am I zoomed out? Yeah, I'm zoomed out all the way. Uh, let me draw a picture of it because it's hard to see here. Okay. So there's a SMA connector with threads and um, center conductor has a wire and then there's these four little posts in the corner and they each have wires. So there's four wires and a center wire. So there's five wires and they're all the same length. Okay. They're all six inches. Uh, so six inches, six inches, six inches, six inches. Okay. And it's on a coax and I've calibrated it right here. I, I disconnected the antenna and I calibrated out my wire. And so I'm calibrated right at this point here. So let's go take a look at it with the VNA. Okay, and I'm going to kind of hold it over my head so it doesn't get interfered with. Uh, these need to kind of be in free space. All antennas need to be in free space. So here's the dip. So I found that this one radiate, uh, resonates around 500 megahertz. And our dip's around 491, something like that. And then this is what the Smith chart looks like. And the Smith chart is reading 23 ohms. Okay. Um, and then depending on where we are, it's, here's 20 ohms, here's 24 ohms. So yeah, it's, it's, it's low ohmage. Um, so that's what verticals do. Okay. And, uh, we could, we could zoom out a bit farther, maybe, uh, stimulus span 400, oops, not 40. I want it 400 span four, ah, 400 megahertz. There you go. So we have this little dip here, right? So it, it's not a great, not a great match because this is calibrated at 50 ohms, right? And this thing, this thing's measuring about 27 ohms, maybe 30 ohms now, right? So we're kind of in, kind of in the theoretical range now. And so what's the trick that I talked about? Okay. So the trick is, uh, let's see, let me, let me, it's going to, this is so hard to film because it's such small wire. Let me just draw a little picture over here. So instead of having the vertical antenna look like this, we're going to take these four wires and we're going to droop them down 45 degrees. So those four wires are going to, uh, not be 90 degrees. They're going to be bent down. So we're going to, we're going to bend them down. So I'm going to bend all four wires down. And don't ask me for the mathematics or the theory of why this works. Um, is uh, now let's look. Now we have a really, really good match. Look at that. Now we're measuring really, really, really good. And we're measuring 51 ohms. So, <laughs> so by dipping the, uh, dipping the uh, wires down, you change the characteristic impedance of the amplifier. And like I said, don't ask me why, but that's the way it works. And you'll see a lot of these antennas with the wires dipped down. And it's not to make it look cool. It's to actually make it be 50 ohms because characteristically it wants to be, look at that really, really deep, deep thing there. Wow. Resonance. So this is a really, really nice antenna at 472 megahertz, right? So, um, anyway, I'm really excited that, you know, when you, when you know theory, and you know how calibration instruments work and you have some vague understanding of how antennas work. Um, uh, you, you can do things like this. And so, you know, don't go spend a hundred dollars on an antenna, you know, go build your own. Oh my gosh. Wire three, right? It's antennas are like one of the, one of the most inexpensive hobbies in, in the world. Uh, get yourself some wire and do crazy things. And if you've got land, oh my gosh, you can build rhomboid antennas, um, you could build all kinds of really, really cool antennas. I heard of an antenna once in, in, um, uh, Texas, that was a, a Yagi antenna and it was so big that it was on train tracks so he could rotate it. <laughs> uh, pretty crazy. Anyway, there you go. Quarter wave antennas, um, uh, 36 ohms, bend them down 50 ohms. Uh, yeah, it's magic.